Hi, this is your host Avlim Bhartia and welcome to a brand new episode of our series TFIR topic of the month aka T3M and this month's topic is platform engineering is DevOps there and our next guest today is Utpal Bhatt. CMO at Tigera. Utpal, it's great to have you today on the show to discuss this topic. Thank you, Swapnil. It's a pleasure to be back here on TFIR, one of my favorite shows. I'm uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, as you have seen, you know, at KubeCon last year in Detroit, uh, there were some booths which are like DevOps is there, and we are also hearing a lot about platform engineering these days. So I want to go deeper into these uh, topics, and I'd love to have your insights there. But before we get started, can you talk about what kind of evolution you are seeing in that space when we talk about culture, personas, we talked about DevOps, SREs, now platform engineering. So so what are you seeing there? So I can offer a perspective from... Uh from the standpoint of our customers. And you know, one of the things we do is we, we continually speak to our customers uh, to uh, you know hear from them what are the challenges they're facing, how they distribute the, the workloads, the, uh, the you know, responsibilities, et cetera. So what we are seeing is that uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, if, we, if we kind of rewind uh, and go a few years back, uh, these uh, cloud native architectures uh, started emerging or it was and, and the, the impetus there were there were three three drivers in my in my, my in my opinion and one was that uh, the uh, the whole uh, ci cd the emergence of the ci cd uh, process or the pipeline where there was uh, an increasing reliance on automation all the way from uh, the way code gets uh, uh, submitted to version control, gets built, gets uploaded, and the automation was necessary to increase the pace of innovation. Right, you really didn't. Uh, you wanted to get away from these monolithic uh, re- releases, and and you wanted to be more nimble. Right, so that was number one. Number two was, uh, you know, we started seeing increasing use of uh, cloud or at least cloud native architectures. You know, where organizations started moving into the cloud and. Uh, Initially, it was a lift and shift, and then it was that let's truly embrace uh, everything that the cloud offers and become cloud native. And you know, then you started looking at microservices. Um, now, because of all these uh, changes kind of happening simultaneously, that there was a, a requirement for this uh, a new, I would say, uh, you know, new capable, uh, new skills. Uh, so to speak, from from folks, right? You needed because the development and operations were tightly integrated. You know, you needed uh, that level of uh, sophistication in the development team to understand the the ops side of things, right? There, you know, that's the DevOps team. DevOps was born, and then uh, because a lot of these uh, uh, a lot of these uh, functions were automated, uh, you know, it introduced more security gaps. And all of a sudden, you now had to start thinking about security as well uh, early on in your, and so there was this uh, increasing uh, uh, need for shift left and security and so on. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, you also saw that uh, there is, you know, if we fast forward now, you know, two years, three years, and we take stock of you know where things are, and we still find that uh, you know there is uh, still uh, a need for some sort of specialization. So, for example, when people start talking about DevOps is dead, it really originates from the fact that because your development team had to understand a lot about the infrastructure, sometimes you took away your best developers and put them on ops kind of problems and. Uh, you know, was that the best thing for your business? Uh, you know, should they be really focused on your core uh, business applications rather than worrying about infrastructure challenges? And, you know, is there an opportunity to centralize that and have a single group that that specialize on that, you know, i.e. the platform engineer? And then the same thing around the security side of things that, you know, we were kind of insisting on shift left, but, uh, you know, do all the developers and DevOps people understand everything that, that's required from a security and compliance standpoint. And on the other hand, do all the security people 
understand the nitty gritties of uh, a cloud native architecture and the surface area. And, you know, not only do they understand that, do they actually want to, right? Is that they're, they're in their wheelhouse. So, you know, we also see that the need for a little bit more specialization, and I think it'll continue to be the case. In other words, you know, if I had to, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, uh, and I, I don't, I, I guess I, I can't foresee things like I, I'm not a fortune teller, but if I had to, if I had to uh, see you know, how this is going to evolve, I do feel like there is a room for specialization. I think that we'll need, ha- we need to have developers and operations people and security people work very tightly with each other. I don't think all those roles are going to morph into one. And uh, that's a pipe dream that will, not ha- that will not happen, in my opinion. When we look at platform engineering, DevOps, SREs, are, do you see them as evolution or you see them? So if I ask you to make a Venn diagram, they're like, hey, they, they all have their own supersets or they also overlap. The reason I'm asking is also as we're going to ask, you know, the, the big question is, is DevOps dead is that are they going to replace itself or no? Organization will leave, uh, need all of them. So I just want to understand, you know, how would you define platform engineering, how different it is? Does that question make sense? Absolutely, it makes sense. Now, you know, if you look at it as a from a functional standpoint, which means that you know what uh, what uh, aspect of uh, if you look at the entire CI/CD and and all the way to deployment and production, that uh, you know what percentage of the time needs to be spent on on development and then integration and then deployment and then managing the infrastructure and then looking at it. Uh, from a runtime perspective, that you are secure and your quality of service is uh, is uh, uh, satisfactory, right? So those are kind of so when you look at it from a functional perspective, I do think that there are unique requirements for each uh, each function. You know, when a, a developer who's coding has a unique set of requirements, uh, somebody who is you know in charge of ensuring continuous integration and the builds are happening you know that's a unique function and and you know platform uh, and they are, you know do we have the right infrastructure it's provisioned correctly it's you know configured correctly that's a unique requirement um so so i do from that standpoint i think these are all different areas of uh, functionality depending on the size of the organization you may have one person doing you know two or three things at a time um, and, uh, you know, that's where like the smaller the organization, you know, you will have, uh, that lone wolf that's doing, uh, a lot of things and including, uh, managing the integration deployment, maybe managing your cloud infrastructure and to a certain extent, looking at the quality of service as well. So, so that's kind of happens, but now as you, as you, uh, scale, you know, your application scales, the number of applications you're deploying scales, then that lone wolf model starts to break down. And that's when you're going to need specialized resources, right? Because that's when, that's the time when you're going to realize that, hey, my developer is spending half uh, her time focused on uh, ops stuff, which is not the best use of her time. So maybe I should hire a specialized ops person. Or you know, my ops persons look, you know, investing half their time in understanding security issues. You know, that's not their their wheelhouse. Maybe I should hire a security person. And so I think the larger the organization, the uh, more things you operate at scale, the more uh, specialized functions you're going to invest in. And they all have to work together. So that's kind of how I would explain that, uh, you know, the emergence of or re-emergence of platform engineering I see that in pockets where um, organizations are operating at scale, and and that is very important. I would love to hear if you can. I mean, it's really hard, but I mean, not hard for you. But how would you define a platform engineering? My definition of platform engineering, I would just like to uh, uh, kind of retell the definition I hear from our clients, our customers, right? Because we have companies uh, that uh, are operating uh, you know, large clusters at scale and over uh, you know, several clusters, each cluster with uh, several thousand nodes. So I mean, you're looking at you know, really uh, organizations op- operating at scale. The way they define platform engineering is that you know, um, there is a need for a centralized function that is uh, 
responsible for uh, ensuring secure configuration, compliant configuration, and uh, for ensuring that the platform is able to provide a level of isolation so that you can have multiple tenants or multiple applications run on that, uh, you know, that the platform has a set of processes whereby you're able to, uh, you know, scale up and scale down your applications and so on. So just having a single organization that's responsible uh, for all things, uh, security, compliance, uh, the availability and uh, uh, the scale of your environment is what a platform engineering uh, team does. Now let's let's uh, talk about the elephant in the room, which is, uh, is DevOps really dead? Can it really die? Is DevOps dead? You know, I, I don't, I don't think, uh, like I said, you know, I don't think so. Uh, you know, if you are, a, you know, if you're a, a smaller organization, and uh, you, you know, are you truly going to invest? I mean, do you really have a need for a full-time person just looking at your infrastructure, right? I think that would be an overkill. Um, I do think that DevOps is going to be responsible for that. Now, you know, as the as the organization grows, I think that uh, now there is still a uh, the aspect of uh, you know once the code gets committed to your uh, uh, repository and then taking that all the way and ensuring that you have the right um, 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 security configuration Im embedded in the code ensuring that your images are all scanned and free of vulnerabilities and you know ensuring that uh, you have the right admission controller policies so that you're only allowing clean images into production you know, all those are very important aspects of the CI/CD pipeline that I think the DevOps uh, person will be able to uh, and will need because that individual needs to be embedded inside the development organization. Let me give an example of, uh, let's say you're a large bank and you are uh, you know, different types of application teams. They're all kind of using the single, you know, the, you know, the, the same platform to deploy their applications. But one, let's say one team is developing a, cash management application or an application that needs to be PCI compliant. Now, um, you know, it's the DevOps there, the person that needs to understand that how the security policies uh, need to be configured in order for the team to achieve compliance, right? And then they will have to work with the security team. The platform team is not going to worry about that because that's at a workload level, at an app level, it's, you know, it's a, the problem is going to be with the application team. The developers are not necessarily uh, familiar with, uh, you know, all the different uh, policy configurations required for that sort of isolation. So you do need that DevOps person to apply those types of controls at a workload level before the uh, the container gets deployed. So you know, it's part of your CI/CD pipeline. You have the right security policies encoded and so on. So I do think that there is a need for DevOps there. I want to also talk about, as you're only talking about different personas, uh, uh, if we just break things down, uh, yes, we, we love to talk about technology and software, but uh, companies, you know, uh, people, they want to create companies, solve problems, create products, create services, uh, and developers, you know, they write all those business applications, but we get overwhelmed with all this complexity of cloud native, you know, and most of the time, you know, people are, they spend a lot of resources in this uh, plumbing versus, you know, the resources. So, uh, but these days we have started talking a lot about developer experience to bring back the developer experience as well. Uh, so can you explain what, how would you look at developer experience and what are companies doing to developer experience? And also, if you can also talk what Tiger is doing to help companies in kind of bringing that experience back. You know, so I think the developer experience, uh, um, I mean, I feel like that can be defined in, in many in many different ways, right? And uh, you know, developer experience uh, could be a very holistic uh, view, right? That how do you treat a developer and the developer comes to your website. Now, you know, in many cases, developers are the users of your product. They may not be the end buyers of your product, but are you treating them, um, you know, as if they were the end buyers, right? Like bring in a, and, and that experience that you're providing um, all the way down to, uh, you know, the, your product itself. So, so the way 
in a way, uh, what cloud native applications have done is that, I mean, and developers have always been at the center of, uh, of uh, um, you know, technology um, products and as, as, as a central user. And I think cloud native applications <clears throat> make that uh, even more prominent, the importance of the developer persona. And, and here's why, right? So the cloud native architectures fundamentally, because they are um, you know, highly, uh, they're complex architectures, let's face it, right? They are very ephemeral, they're distributed, they are, uh, uh, you know, they scale up and down. And sometimes, uh, you know, some of your containers are short lived and there's a lot of automation built into it that uh, in the past, uh, you know, you let's take an example of a security operations team or a security team that they could, you know, they they had a general understanding of of how things would work and you know all the architecture and and you know because of a traditional waterfall model, but uh, with the cloud native architecture, um, you know, the security team often runs blind and has to rely on the developer to play their part in helping uh, you know create a more secure application, right? So uh, uh, the developer, like I said, is you know is, is a central entity, and uh, at the same time, you know, developers are primarily concerned with uh, the business uh, aspect of the application, not the ops or the security. You know, it's some somebody else's problem. So I think the developer experience is uh, what in our world developer experience means is that you know, how do we help. Uh, uh, developers by you know becoming an enabler uh, or as opposed to an inhibitor and oftentimes security products are in, seen as inhibitors because uh, you know so many stories we have heard where the development teams will say you know what our security team is always blocking you know our pace of innovation gets reduced uh, down to a crawl because anything anytime we come up with something new the security team says no you can't do this you can't do that you can't do this. you go fix this go fix that and you know, we can, we are never able to release anything or launch anything, right? And that's an example of security becoming a business inhibitor. So what we do with the developer experience and help there is that uh, you know, it's, we certainly want the applications to be highly secure and, and highly compliant. But what we do is we help prioritize what are the most important things the development team needs to fix. So instead of you know, a security team giving a hundred list of hundred things, we'll give them a list of a ranked list saying, these are the most important things that you need to go fix. And if you fix this, then, uh, you know, we are already in a much better position. Also, what we do is we give the developers and DevOps team the ability to deploy mitigating controls. So let's say if you had a log4j type of vulnerability, you know, if I, Somebody could have taken a hard stand saying, unless you fix it, this application cannot go live. Now that fix came, you know, two to three months, uh, you know, took two to three months. Now, for a lot of applications, that's not even an option to be down for two to three months. So what we have is we provide the ability to uh, have uh, security controls that can limit access to the pods running those log4j containers. So that you have this extra layer of security that uh, you have built around those most vulnerable aspects of your application, which buys the developer team a bit more time to fix, right? And so these are the ways we are kind of becoming business enablers. We're enabling, you know, helping security become a business enabler by almost giving developers, uh, you know, making them part of uh, this uh, whole uh, and empathizing with them, saying, you know, it's going to take a long time for you to fix it. Don't worry. In the meantime, we have these controls. And also, we don't want you to fix all 100 things. Let's just fix the three or four things that matter, right? So using all that intelligence and helping the developers with their prioritization, I think that's a huge part of developer experience. We also have to solve uh, almost like a, a, a social uh, challenge uh, that... Uh, you know, that would otherwise, uh, uh, you know, create a lot of issues. You know, and I, as I mentioned, the social uh, issue right now or the cultural issue right now is that the dev teams do not like the CISOs organization. And, you know, they, they see that as a business inhibitor. And 
uh, unfortunately, the cloud native architecture just aggravates that problem uh, because uh, now what's happened is that because the architecture is so complex, uh, the security team really is struggling to understand what is really happening in that architecture. And because they don't understand, you know, they they are probably they are uh, required, or they probably are more inclined to take a more heavy-handed approach, saying, "No, you know, fix everything," because you know I've found this right. Uh, but uh, and and on the, on the other side, other hand, the developers are, uh, you know, they're not security experts, and so they don't know what to fix. But when they see a list of hundred things to fix, they get completely overwhelmed, saying, "Well, this whole whole promise of." cloud native architecture was all about ag agility and rapid innovation and that we're just not realizing that. So I think the social problem that has to be solved is how do we bring the two teams together? And that's going to that's gonna be if we have the use of software that kind of truly empathizes with the other. Uh, so in case of a security, you know, it provides them with complete visibility on you know, what is happening in the inside of this cloud native architecture. How do I interpret uh, vulnerability here and this, you know, the the potential uh, uh, exposure, my exposure risk, and how do I understand all that? And then on the developer side, rather than giving them a list of two hundred things to fix, you know, here are the five things to fix. Let's just work on fixing these five. And I think that I feel is uh, <clears throat> is what's going to be a winning combination. Excellent. Once again, uh, very well said. Uh, last, before we wrap this up, is that as you were also earlier talking about that as companies grow, they may or may not need, you know, certain persona like DevOps. Uh, also, uh, like there are companies who are like, well, bohemots, uh, they have all the resources and there are a lot of new companies when they hear these terms, you know, Kubernetes and some, there are a lot of, you know, comic strips also. We have to move to the cloud. We have to move to Kubernetes without knowing whether they have to go there. And now when we think about platform engineering, hey, what is our platform engineering strategy? So, what advice do you have companies when they look at these things that should they embrace, should they even consider, do they need, should they start with the solution? Like we should embrace platform engineering or DevOps or should they start with asking a lot of questions? Do we need it? What is your advice? Yeah, you know, I think that, uh, I mean, I would say it's, it's really, uh, it should mirror the evolution of, uh, of your organization. You know, you should functionally, you should always have these as as distinct practices you know you should have your development uh, best practices deployment best practices infrastructure management best practices security best best practices functionally you should have these best practices as early in your uh, in your life cycle as possible whether you staff it with one person doing three things at a time or whether you have each thing being done by a unique individual. That's just a function of your scale and the maturity of your organization. As you know, the larger the organization, the more mature the organization, you should staff those functional areas by uh, you know, a separate, uh, separate uh, individual in charge of that. Uh, but uh, uh, whether you are a small or large, you should see those as distinct things. You know, development is different. CICD management is different. Managing your infrastructure is, is different. It has a different set of skills and processes needed. You know, monitoring the runtime uh, uh, profile of your application, both from a security and quality of service, is different. And you need a different set of rules, right? So that's how I would, uh, that's how I think about it. Utpal, thank you so much for sharing these great insights uh, with me, with our audience today. And I would love to have you back on the show as usual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swapno.